sounds good. It sounds good. All right. Questions? Absolutely. Keep the barrier for questions. All right. Short story. Here we go. Let me find my opening. Swirling. All right. Good morning. Uh, do I have to? I'm gonna, I gotta do it this time. This mm -hmm. time first. All right. Good morning. I am uh, Costa Constantinidis, chair of the Committee on Environmental Protection. Today, this committee will address the mayor's fiscal 2019 preliminary budget for the Department of Environmental Protection. The department's proposed fiscal 2019 expense budget totals 1.31 billion dollars which is $105.2 million less than fiscal 2018 adopted budget of $1.41 billion. DEP's proposed capital commitment plan for fiscal 2018 through fiscal 2022 includes $13.8 billion, which is $65.7 million more than the adopted commitment plan. The committee looks forward to hearing testimony on several important topics, including the agency's work to con address combined sewer overflows, measures to enhance water supply redundancy, budgetary considerations put forth in the proposed capital commitment plan, and agency performance in light of the release of the preliminary mayor's management report. Commissioner Sapienza of the Department of Environmental Protection will be providing testimony today. Before we hear from the commissioner, I'd like to thank the committee staff for putting together today's hearing, including Jonathan Seltzer, our finance analyst right here to my left, our, our counsel to the committee, Samara Swanston right here to my right, Nadia Johnson, our policy analyst as well, and Nick Wazowski, my legislative counsel. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to the chair of the subcommittee on capital for our finance committee, great advocate for the environment, our, our co-chair of today's hearing, Vanessa Gibson. Thank you so much, Chair, and good morning to each and every one of you. Welcome to City Hall. I am Councilmember Vanessa Gibson of the 16th District in the Borough of the Bronx, and I'm so excited to be here um, as the Chair of the new Subcommittee on Capital Budget. I'd like to thank my fellow co-chair, our Chair of Environmental Protection, Costa Constantinides, and certainly the members of the Environmental Protection Committee, as well as the Subcommittee, and thank them for being here this morning. Um, I'd like to recognize Councilmember Barry Griden and Chick for being here. Thank you, colleague. Uh, this morning, in its second hearing as part of the FY 2019 preliminary budget hearings, this subcommittee on capital budget will be hearing from the Department of Environmental Protection. I want to thank Commissioner Sapienza for being here today, and I look forward to hearing your testimony from you and your colleagues. DEP's preliminary capital budget totals $13.7 billion in fiscal 2018 through 2022, representing nearly one-fifth of the city's total capital plan. The preliminary capital plan has grown slightly when compared to the department's FY 2018 adopted commitment plan due to a variety of projects from water pollution control to supply and equipment purchases. Throughout this month in the council, this subcommittee will not only seek to address those areas in which the city can improve the capital process, but certainly will also seek to learn from those city agencies who generally implement such projects effectively. And I'm so proud to say that DEP is one of those agencies who certainly uh, we are looking to for your leadership and certainly replicating a lot of the great work that DEP has done. The department's capital commitment rate for 2017, 78%, well above the citywide average of 56%. This agency 
Um, this continues an agency trend of beating our citywide average. These commitments are particularly impressive given the nature of many of our DEP projects, which are often complex, <laughs> complicated, and involve many moving pieces. So I want to commend DEP for this great success, and I hope at today's hearing this morning we're able to highlight some of the best practices that might be replicated across other city agencies. The subcommittee will also continue to advocate throughout our hearings for design build authority for many of our capital projects. And I am just returning from Albany yesterday, um, meeting with many of my former colleagues in the state legislature, including our governor talking about design build. So I'm very interested in hearing from DEP about agency projects where design build might be applicable. Finally, as with the other agencies that the subcommittee will hear from later on this month, I hope to examine ways to increase our transparency and communication in the capital budgeting process and in other areas. In terms of budgeting, DEP's commitment plan, similar to many other agencies, includes overly broad budget lines that can make it difficult to track individual projects to exert meaningful oversight. With respect to a process, like DOT, DEP performs numerous projects that affect work that is done by other entities, such as many of our utility companies, as well as work in locations outside of the city of New York. Uh, DOT Commissioner Polly Trottenberg mentioned to us last week that DOT meets regularly with other parties and stakeholders to get them on the same page about their ongoing work. So I'm certainly interested in DEP's participation in interagency as well as working with our partners outside of the city of New York and learning more about the relationships that you have with our local governments outside of the city. So I look forward to hearing from our commissioner today about these and other issues, and I'd like to also thank the finance staff who worked very hard to prepare for today's hearing, our finance director, Latanya McKinney, our deputy directors, Nathan Toll and Regina Parada ryan our finance unit head, Krillian Francisco, our finance analyst, John Seltzer, and our finance counsels, Eric Bernstein to my left and Rebecca Chasen to my right. And with that, I want to thank our co-chair for hosting today's hearing. And now we'll turn it back to Chair Constantinides. Thank you. Great. Uh, so Samara Swanson will swear in the witnesses. Would you please raise your right hand? Do you swear for him to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? I do. Commissioner, good to see you again. Good to see you too. Good morning, uh, Chair Constantinidis and Chair Gibson. So I am Vincent Sapienza, the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, at the table here today with me is Joseph Murin, who's our Chief Financial Officer, uh, Deputy Commissioner Michael Deloach, and behind me is DEP's senior team who will help with uh, questions and answers if we should need. Um, so before I start, Chair Constantinidis, I just want to, you know, say thank you again for all your uh, support and great work on, on many of our shared priorities for sustainability and resiliency, a lot of environmental justice things we've been doing, and just protecting the overall environment of the city. So thank you on that. And Chair Gibson, congratulations. We got to sit down the other day and go through some of uh, the work that we're doing. And, you know, we look to continue to work with you and the, the team on, on DEP's uh, capital commitment for our critical infrastructure. Uh, we also want to give a special welcome to the, the new council members who, who are on these committees, and we look forward to, to highlighting some of our great work and working with them in the future. So as background, DEP has the overall responsibility for the city's water supply and sewer system, including providing drinking water to all New Yorkers, maintaining pressure to fire hydrants, managing stormwater, and collecting and treating wastewater. In addition, DEP regulates air quality, hazardous waste, and critical quality of life issues, including noise. All of our water-related expenses, both operational and capital, are paid for with money collected from the water and sewer rate charges billed to our 834,000 rate payers. The water rate is authorized annually by the New York City Water Board. As you know, Mayor de Blasio completely eliminated the rental payment five years sooner than originally projected. The full elimination of the rental payment will result in a savings of 7% or $1.1 billion for our customers through FY 2020. 
In 2016, the city proposed and the Water Board approved a $183 credit to more than 664,000 homeowners. Uh, and that was subsequently challenged in court. Uh, but we're happy to report that the New York State Court of Appeals has ultimately upheld the board's authority to issue such a credit. Um, and, and we began posting those credits on the water bills last month. Um, and so over the next few months, those of you that uh, are paying a bill will, will see that credit reflected. Um, g going forward, um, now that this issue is behind us, uh, we look uh, forward again to doing a standard rate setting uh, for fiscal 19, and uh, we, we will be discussing with the Water Board uh, in the next month or so, and then uh, doing five borough hearings uh, starting in May. Uh, I'd also take, like to take a minute to highlight that our harbor waters are cleaner and healthier than they've been in more than a century. Key indicators of water quality, including the concentrations of bacteria and nitrogen, continue to drop, while dissolved oxygen is on the rise. We are hearing more and more reports of whales, dolphins, and seals returning to our waterways, and we are proud to see that our hard work to date has, has been paying off. Um, and finally, I wanted to highlight an accomplishment from last session that will have real impact on New Yorkers, reducing construction noise. Local Law 53, sponsored by Councilmember Kalos and passed by the Environmental uh, Protection Committee last fall and signed by the mayor in January, uh, will reduce construction noise across the city, which is the number one complaint to 311. As you know, the law authorizes DEP to now take street level sound measurements in the public right of way, 50 feet from construction related noise sources. Previously, DEP inspectors were required to measure noise levels from within the dwellings of the residents who filed the noise complaints. The new law establishes different enforceable sound levels for residential and commercial areas, as well as for street work. In the event that a construction-related noise complaint cannot be resolved, DEP can now issue limited stop work orders for equipment that exceeds the noise levels while allowing the rest of the construction work to continue. It's a great piece of legislation, and we appreciate the collaboration between the council and DEP. Uh, so now I'll, I'll start uh, discussing the FY19 four-year capital plan. Uh, so our four-year capital plan is approximately $11.2 billion for FY19 through 22, uh, as presented by Mayor de Blasio on February 1st, 2018. It's an increase of $748 million, or 7.2%, over the FY18 September capital improvement plan of $10.4 billion. The funding will allow our nearly 6,000 employees to continue to expand upon our history of reliability and innovation. I'll now provide some highlights for the fiscal 19 through 22 plan, focusing on drinking water supply, the sewer network, harbor water quality, and initiatives to promote the overall health of the New York City environment. I'll also provide updates on performance metrics pertaining to the mission of our complex agency. So first on drinking water, the New York City water supply system provides approximately one billion gallons of safe drinking water to about nine million people. Um, this includes residents of the city of New York, uh, the millions of tourists and commuters who visit the city throughout the year, and approximately one million people living in the counties of Westchester, Putnam, Orange, and Ulster. In all, the city of New, the, the New York City water supply system provides nearly half of the population of New York State with drinking water. We work hard to deliver an exceptionally high quality of water, one that regularly wins national taste tests. DEP scientists collect samples 365 days a year from our expansive reservoir system, the aqueducts that deliver the water to the city, and from roughly 1,000 sampling stations across the five boroughs. These water samples are delivered to one of DEP's four state-of-the-art laboratories where scientists analyze them for more than 600,000 times annually. Uh, in addition, we have robotic monitoring buoys uh, in our reservoirs that provide an additional 1.2 million measurements per year that help us to send the best water to the city at all times. For FY19 to 22, the administration is proposing to invest significantly in protecting the quality of our reservoirs and the integrity of our dams providing for treatment where necessary, and maintaining and repairing the water main system conveying potable water to all New Yorkers. We have budgeted a total of $1.2 billion for water supply contracts, including $30 million for closeout at the Croton Water Filtration Plant, $185 million to continue our watershed protection programs, 
and $376 million to reconstruct dams in the watershed. There is also $1.2 billion allocated for the replacement of in-city water mains, which includes $765 million for specific water main work, $77 million to accelerate the replacement of underground water distribution infrastructure, $67 million for emergency contracts for water distribution, and $85 million to keep our water distribution assets in a state of good repair. As cities around the country and world struggle to deliver safe drinking water due to drought, climate change, budget shortages, and aging infrastructure, DEP is prioritizing the following projects and programs to guarantee the dependability and resiliency of the city's water supply system. So first I'll start with the filtration avoidance determination. For decades, New York City has recognized that it is environmentally sound and cost effective to protect drinking water at its source. Uh, this past December, the New York State Department of Health awarded DEP a new 10-year waiver to continue delivering unfiltered drinking water from our Catskill, Delaware water supply called the Filtration Avoidance Determination, or FAD. This agreement commits the city, working with our upstate partners, to invest about a billion dollars over the next decade towards programs to protect our drinking water. If the FAD had not been re renewed, the city would be required to build a new filtration plant, which would have cost upwards of $10 billion to build and over $100 million annually to operate. These costs would have been passed on to our ratepayers. Maintaining the FAD is one of our highest priorities, and the city's science-based approach to watershed protection has made our program a national and international model for protection. Uh, under prior FADs, DEP has preserved more than 150,000 acres of land, upgraded wastewater infrastructure throughout the watershed, worked with farmers to ensure their operations are both efficient and protective of water quality, and focused considerable attention on the natural infrastructure of our streams, wetlands, and forests. These programs are critical to our success, and the capital plan includes $185 million to continue FAD-related programs over the next four years. Uh, on the Delaware Aqueduct Repair, I'm pleased to report that uh, the work progresses on schedule and on budget for the $1 billion repair of the Delaware Aqueduct, which includes the construction of a 2.5-mile bypass tunnel uh, that is now being drilled 600 feet below the Hudson River from Newburgh to Wappinger. DEP <coughs> began tunneling last September, and we expect to make the connection to the existing uh, aqueduct in 2022. Uh, city water tunnel number three, the, the Brooklyn Queens leg. So our, our, our plan includes $600 million to complete the Brooklyn Queens leg of tunnel three, uh, which is primarily for funding of two sh new shafts that will be drilled from the surface down to where the tunnel is. Uh, in December 2017, DEP brought uh, the Brooklyn Queens leg of the tunnel itself, the, so the below ground section of tunnel, into a state of activation readiness meaning that in the unlikely event of a major failure of city tunnel number one or two, DEP could quickly deliver water through city water tunnel number three to Brooklyn and Queens. Uh, on the Kensco Eastview Tunnel, DEP has allocated an additional $35 million, bringing the total allocation to $808 million for this project. When completed, the project will provide additional redundancy for New York City's water delivery system. Um, an additional $33 million was added to the plan for a total of $117 million for upgrades to the Ashokan Reservoir, the Olive Bridge Dam, and the Dividing Ware Bridge. Upgrades to these nearly 100-year-old assets will ensure continued compliance with New York State dam safety regulations, as well as the continued safety of the public traveling over the Dividing Ware Bridge. I'll now turn to sewers. DEP is responsible for the maintenance of more than 7,000 miles of sewers throughout the city. Over the last several years, DEP has embraced a data-driven, proactive approach to operating and maintaining the sewer system. By using a range of digital tools and innovative practices, DEP developed targeted programs to provide a high level of service to our customers while focusing on investments that prioritize resources. Over the past decades, decade, these programs have significantly driven down confirmed sewer backups. Since 2013, we have also been more proactively cleaning sewers rather than the previous practice of reactively cleaning them after a backup occurred. In 2017, more than 400 miles of sewers were proactively cleaned. The leading cause of sewer backups continues to be the buildup of fats, oils, and greases. Uh, in 2017, this caused more than 70% of confirmed backups. 
Since 2015, DEP has engaged thousands of households, multifamily properties, religious organizations, civic associations, and educational institutions in communication on the proper disposal of used cooking oil and the harmful effects on the sewer infrastructure. Credit for another successful sewer initiative goes to the City Council with passage of Local Law 48 of 2015. The law required DEP to inspect and clean as necessary all 148,000 street catch basins on a yearly basis rather than on the prior three-year cycle. The accelerated cycle proved beneficial both for debris removal and to more quickly address defects that required repair. The plan for FY19 through 22 projects uh, uh, we project is uh, $2.6 billion of spending on sewers, which includes the build out of Southeast Queens for $796 million. Uh, in addition, the plan allocates $916 million to replace sewers, uh, including the mayor's initiative for accelerated replacement, $1.6 billion to construct new sewers of all types, of which $112 million is for high-level storm sewers, and $270 million to expand the, expand the Blue Belt drainage system on Staten Island. Uh, now I want to talk about the initiative in Southeast Queens. Uh, Southeast Queens experienced rapid residential and commercial growth from the 1920s through 1960s, and many of the natural water courses that previously drained the area were paved over by developers, exacerbating flooding. The low-lying topography of the area and the enlargement of Kennedy Airport significantly complicated the installation of large storm sewers, making plans work extremely costly. Major projects had been deferred until Mayor de Blasio authorized $1.5 billion over 10 years for the Southeast Queens Flood Mitigation Plan. Uh, this has since been increased to even more than that. We've added money to that program. Uh, together with our partners at the Department of Design and Construction and the Department of Transportation, DEP has developed a four-pronged approach to improve conditions in Southeast Queens. Uh, first is we're constructing quick fixes such as storm sewer extensions, targeted full-size sewers and green infrastructure to bring near-term flooding relief. Uh, second, we're, we will build uh, neighborhood sewers um, where, where there's existing capacity in the existing sewer system. Uh, third, we'll create future capacity for further neighborhood sewer projects by investing in large trunk sewers. Uh, and, and finally, we're evaluating opportunities to reduce groundwater flooding. Together, these four approaches are starting to deliver both immediate and long-lasting relief for many residents in Southeast Queens. As requested by the Council, an easy-to-use map uh, of the, this work is now available on our website. Uh, now touching on wastewater treatment. DEP manages an average of 1.3 billion gallons of wastewater each day through our 14 wastewater treatment facilities. The alignment with wastewater utilities across the country, um, DEP is embracing best practices to ensure a sustainable future that minimizes waste, maximizes resources, protects our ratepayers, improves the community, and embraces innovation. Wastewater resource recovery is an essential element in delivering maximum environmental benefits at the least cost to society. DEP is working to promote our role in energy optimization, greenhouse gas reduction, carbon sequestration, and operational improvements to efficiently manage the expense budget while expanding environmental opportunities. Our capital plan projects a $2.6 billion capital investment for the upgrade, reconstruction, or replacement of components of the wastewater treatment plants and pumping stations. While DEP is a world leader in water supply delivery and wastewater treatment, we are, are constantly looking for innovative ways to curb cost and to enhance the environment of New York City. These efforts include commitments uh, to the zero waste to landfill initiative uh, that the mayor put forth as well as his 80 by 50 initiative. So we'll first talk about zero waste. Uh, last year in 2017, our wastewater treatment plants generated 490,000 tons of biosolids, which are the nutrient-rich organic materials that are generated during the wastewater treatment process. Last year, approximately 74% of those biosolids went to landfill. 15% were used as alternative daily landfill cover, and 11% were beneficially used through mine reclamation and composting. Our goal of zero by 30 is to have non-landfill beneficial use of 100% of our biosolids by 2030, with year-over-year -year progress starting in 2019. 
To this end, we are in the process of awarding a 150 ton per day contract for beneficial use only, as well as developing short and long-term master plans for beneficial end use. As you may recall, DEP, in conjunction with the company Waste Management uh, and National Grid, is launching a pilot demonstration project at our Newtown Creek, Creek Wastewater Treatment Plant in Brooklyn to accept food waste from the city's organics program. DEP began accepting food waste in 2016 and has ramped up to 80 tons per day of food waste today. In addition to supporting the city's zero waste initiative, this effort also increases digest or gas production at the plant, which is a clean renewable fuel. By the end of 2018, we expect that National Grid will complete construction of their biogas scrubbing system, which will allow excess digest or gas from the Newtown Creek plant to be delivered into the nearby natural gas pipeline. Uh, on 80 by 50, uh, in support of the mayor's commitment to reduce greenhouse emissions, uh, DEP has launched a number of initiatives, and I'll briefly describe. Uh, so first, digester gas. Uh, on average, our wastewater treatment facilities generate 3.6 billion cubic feet of digester gas per year, of which approximately only 35 percent is used at the plants beneficially to power boilers and engines, uh, while the remaining is really worthlessly flared. Um, over the next three decades, DEP will be phasing out flaring of gas by developing on-site usage, such as expanding our ability to use it as a substitute for fuel or electricity. Uh, and delivering our digester gas into the natural gas grid. Uh, solar, by leveraging DCAS's funding, DEP is currently conducting a solar photovoltaic uh, and energy storage feasibility study for the Wards Island treatment plant, uh, at which there are prime opportunities to install solar photovoltaic canopies over the wastewater treatment processing tanks. Uh, in addition, DEP is also evalu evaluating ground mount and parking canopy solutions in the watershed. Uh, for energy conservation, over the past several years, DEP has identified more than 400 energy conservation measures. At these uh, uh, as these facilities are upgraded, DEP is seeking opportunities to integrate energy conservation measures into its state of good repair capital planning process. Uh, on cogeneration, uh, which uses methane that's produced during the wastewater treatment process uh, to generate electricity and heat last year, we began construction on a $267 million project at our North River plant to replace the plant's existing 1980s vintage diesel-powered system uh, with five new natural gas-fired uh, and, and digester gas-fueled cogeneration engines. This project will result in improved energy efficiency, power supply reliability, and air quality, while also maximizing the beneficial use of the methane produced on site. Um, it, in, in our plan, we also have uh, $220 million to upgrade the digesters at the Hunts Point Wastewater Treatment Plant, which will more effectively break down organic matter, reducing the amount of residual solids that need to be trucked from the site through the neighborhood. More methane gas will also be produced, uh, which will be used to offset purchased fuel. And I want to speak about harbor water quality. Uh, approximately 60% of New York City is served by combined sewers where stormwater runoff and sanitary waste are conveyed in a single pipe beneath each street to a wastewater treatment plant. The system was originally designed so that during moderate to heavy rain events, excess water gets released untreated into local waterways, which is referred to as combined sewer overflows, or CSOs. Uh, when the city's long-term control process for CSOs kicked off in 2012, DEP began engaging the public in the development of each plan. Over the years, we have listened to feedback on ways to improve our public engagement strategies. In response, we have worked to make our complicated presentations and information materials more, friend more user friendly, coordinated with local organizations on meeting dates and locations, held dozens of public meetings, and responded to public comments. Last November, we announced that going forward, the public will have an opportunity to review and comment on our proposed plans before they are submitted to New York State DEC for its review. Uh, under the long-term CSO planning process, DEP will be investing at least another $4.4 billion to make further CSO reductions over the next 25 years. The plan includes $1.5 billion for plan consent order work related to the long-term control plans for combined sewer overflow. Um, 
in 2017, New York State DEC approved seven of the city's plans with two additional plans under review by the state. Two of these plans call for enormous CSO storage tunnels beneath Brooklyn and Queens to reduce further overflows into Flushing Bay and Newtown Creek. DEP is currently developing two more plans, one for Jamaica Bay and another for the East River and open waters. Once these plans are identified, they will be able, we will be able to estimate the cost associated with them. The approved LCP, T, LTCPs for Alley Creek, Flushing Creek, and the Hutchinson River include projects to disinfect CSOs using bleach with the intent of significantly reducing pathogens during the recreational season. I recently met with several environmental groups and I acknowledge their concerns about residual chlorine entering water bodies where it could potentially have an effect on marine biota. It should be noted that these three projects will also include dechlorination system to eliminate any residual chlorine compounds prior to release uh, and we will conduct extensive environmental reviews during the design phase before proceeding with construction. The ultimate goal of eliminating CSOs is daunting, given the challenge of siting extremely large infrastructure in a very dense city and the massive capital costs, which could exceed $30 billion for New York City. The LTCPs represent a significant next step and one that won't break the backs of middle and working class homeowners who pay a water bill. DEP looks forward to it, continuing dialogue with stakeholders, with the City Council, and with New York State DEC on this complex issue. On green infrastructure, in 2010, DEP launched, launched a green infrastructure program in the combined sewer areas of the city to help reduce CSOs. DEP has worked diligently to advance construction of green infrastructure in priority areas, which reduces the amount of stormwater runoff entering the wastewater system and adds multiple co-benefits for New Yorkers, such as decreased ponding, increased shade, and community greening. To date, DEP has constructed approximately 4,000 green infrastructure assets, the majority of which are located in the right-of-way. From its outset, DEP committed $1.5 billion for the green infrastructure program, of which over $468 million has been encumbered to date and another $990 million has been budgeted through fiscal year 2027. The funding will be used to continue to build right-of-way rain gardens as well as green infrastructure retrofits on city-owned property through partnerships with the New York City Housing Authority and the Departments of Education and Parks and Recreation. These partnerships allow us leverage funding uh, and support from other city initiatives, such as Parks' Community Parks Initiative. Uh, and we have added $50 million to that program to ensure that these parks are managing stormwater runoff and contributing to healthier waterways. To date, DEP has completed 48 public retrofit projects with our partners, and 200 are currently in design. Uh, I briefly want to talk about the Gowanus Canal now. Uh, the Gowanus is a major priority for the city and for DEP. Uh, EPA has required the, the city to limit CSOs into the canal by constructing two underground tanks and associated infrastructure to intercept and store CSOs during wet weather events. We are on the final step of our ULURP application with the council hearing just this past Monday. We have been pleased that stakeholders seem to approve our approach uh, with the community board, borough president, and city planning commission all supporting our application with conditions. We are hopeful to acquire these properties without eminent domain, uh, but we will still meet our milestones even if that is not the case. It is important to meet that schedule of milestones on this project as if we do not stay on schedule, the EPA could have us move to, a, to do the project uh, under an adjacent park and, and community swimming pool, um, and we sh share the community's oppos opposition to that alternative. Uh, so now I'll speak about the FY19 expense budget. Uh, the projected expense budget for the current fiscal year FY18 is $1.3 billion. That includes approximately $80.2 million in community development block grant funds for the Build It Back program, for which DEP serves as a contracting entity for the city. Uh, therefore, backing out that Build It Back uh, funding, DEP's FY19 preliminary expense budget is $1.2 billion. The preliminary FY19 expense budget breaks into the following large categories. $543.8 million, or about 41.6% of the budget, is for personal services to pay the salaries of our nearly 6,000 funded positions. 
763.8 million dollars or 58.4 percent is for other than personal services OTPS which includes taxes on upstate watershed lands which account for 167.2 million dollars and nearly 12.8 percent of our expense budget uh, as you may know our growing ownership of watershed lands represents a critical investment in maintaining the high quality of the city's drinking water by protecting it at the source and ensuring that it does not require more expensive treatment such as filtration. I am pleased to report that we have successfully negotiated agreements with upstate state jurisdictions to make our tax obligations more stable and predictable. Uh, DEP's energy costs, including heat, light, and power, account for $92.8 million, or 7.1% of our FY19 expense budget. DEP is the third largest municipal consumer of electric power in the city after the Department of Education, Health, and Hospitals, and our consumption will grow as we bring new online treatment processes for wastewater. To control energy costs and to meet Mayor de Blasio's major commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, DEP is investing in projects to reduce energy needs, including the cogeneration plant at the North River treatment plant that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the chemicals that are necessary for both our drinking water supply and our wastewater treatment are estimated to cost $49 million in FY19, or about 3.7% of the expense budget. For drinking water, DEP continues to add chlorine and fluoride to the Cattell water in order to meet federal, state, and city treatment requirements. Also for drinking water, the treatment process at the new Croton water filtration plant requires additional chemicals. Our wastewater plants rely on the addition of polymers, sodium hydroxide, glycerol, and ferric chloride, as well as other chemicals, to improve removal rates and continue to disinfect their effluents with chlorine compounds as we've done since the 1930s. Uh, on sludge management, uh, we produce between 1,200 and 1,300 tons per day, uh, and that's projected to cost $56.4 million for FY19, which is about 4.3% which of our expense budget. As mentioned earlier, we will continue to identify ways to reduce these costs by finding a more beneficial use. Uh, just briefly on cost-saving initiatives, uh, DEP has taken a hard look at our processes to identify where uh, we can reduce costs without sacrificing quality or reliability. One example of this is the chemical glycerol, which DEP uses to meet strict regulatory requirements to remove nitrogen from wastewater. In 2017, DEP spent almost $8 million for glycerol. In an effort to reduce costs, DEP rebid the glycerol contracts with improved contract terms, and we achieved a price reduction of approximately 55% per pound of glycerol, about $4 million in overall savings. We are anticipating several million dollars in savings in 2018. Uh, in addition, through the ingenuity of our workforce, DEP attained $3.4 million in savings last year through operational changes to our process air system, overhauling tanks and house, and other creative initiatives. Uh, we look to expand these best practices and increase these savings in, in the future. Um, so finally, on behalf of the 6,000 employees uh, at DEP across the city and upstate, I, you know, I want to again express our appreciation to uh, Chairman Constantinides for your uh, steadfast environmental leadership and to Chair Gibson uh, and you have our continued commitment to collaborating with you uh, and your committee on delivering our infrastructure program. Uh, I want to thank you all for the opportunity to present testimony today and we look forward to answering questions. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, we're joined by Councilmember Grudenchik, Councilmember Richards, Councilmember Matteo. I know Helen Rosenthal, Councilmember Rosenthal was here as well. Um, so I'll ask a couple of questions, then I'll kick it back to the chair, and then we'll open it up to the, reg the, the other council members. Um, so looking at biosolids, you talked about coming up with a sort of long-term plan about, you said about 150 per day? 150 tons per day. And how much do we, we, we create? About 1,300, right? Yes. So how do we scale that up over the next, and you put 30 years, how do we do that? Uh, so, so it, it's a challenging program, uh, but it, we, we, just a little bit of a history. So, in 1988, Congress unanimously passed the Ocean Dumping Ban Act. Municipalities used to take their biosolids and dump it out at sea, and, and since that time, municipalities have had to either incinerate it or land apply it, and DEP has been land applying it. Um, Probably going back 10 years when the recession hit, the cost of beneficially land applying it on crop lands, on grazing lands, 
went up in value a lot, and it was costing DEP over $40 million a year at one point, or I think we hit 50 at, back 10 years ago. And landfill costs were very low due to the recession, and we, we had been landfilling our sludge ever since. We would like to now more beneficially use that sludge, get it out of landfills, and it does have a nutrient value to use it. So as a first step, we're issuing this $150 million, uh, this 150 ton per day, sorry, contract uh, to, to take our biosolids and use it for a beneficial purpose rather than just essentially putting it in, in landfill as waste. Over time, we'll, we will see how that first contract progresses and then try to move forward. But our goal is by 2030 to eliminate that 1,300 tons per day from going to landfill. Okay. All right, so looking next at uh, Flushing Bay, I know that there's a dredging project going on there. Uh, the timeline is to complete it during this fiscal year? That's correct. And if it doesn't, if we are not able to finish, how are we doing, how, what's the progress so far? Yeah, so so um, we have this project to, to remove dredge material from Flushing Bay. This is just basically sewer sediments that have accumulated over the, the, the decades. The, the dredge work itself, removing that material, is essentially complete. And what we're continuing to do now, council members, is, is, is capping that, that um, site and then doing some shoreline restoration um, and, and some, some greenery of the site. So we fully expect to have that done. So we fully expect it, so it's not going to bleed into FY19. Yeah. And how long will that keep Flushing Bay in good condition? Because, I, you know, it, it's kind of the, the chicken and the egg problem, right? We're, we're still having the, the active CSOs in Flushing Bay. So how long is it going to be until we have to dredge again? That's right. So, so we've done a couple of things. One is uh, several years ago we completed the $400 million project to uh, build a 40 million gallon storage tank to reduce overflows into Flushing Creek, which eventually would make its way into Flushing Bay. But there are still a couple of large CSO outfalls into Flushing Bay, which, as, as you said, Mr. Chair, continue to contribute uh, sewer sediments. One of the projects that we mentioned in the long-term control plan for Flushing Bay is to build a massive storage tunnel um, that will be a couple hundred feet below ground, and that will store combined sewage that would otherwise have overflowed will store it in the tunnel until the storm ends, and then that could be dumped, pumped to a wastewater treatment plant. And that would be with the Bowery Bay wastewater treatment plant? So that would be, be coming through from Flushing Bay, through Jackson Heights, into Astoria, correct? Correct. And what's the sort of timeline on that tunnel? What, what's the sort of long-term plan there? Yeah, so we, we are really in the early stages. We, we hope to begin design, the full design, uh, in the next year or two. but. Um, we, I don't know if we have those the timeline, Joe, Probably for the CSO. Yeah, it's it's late 2020 is its completion. It's a complete of the, of the design. No, of the of the entire process. the entire process. of the entire process. Of late 2020s. Oh, so late tw not late 2020, but late 2020. So yeah, I I, I hear you on that. I mean, as a as a, <laughs> as, a as a representative of of Western Queens that abuts uh, Flushing Bay, but also that that represents the Barrow Bridge treatment plant. I'm, I'm very uh, interested in that project and, and seeing how we progress and seeing how we can best capture as much of the CSO waste there as possible. Uh, and then uh, looking at, uh, again, going back to the CSO issue, um, I know that my colleague, Vagrid Enchik, is probably going to go into more detail on this, um, but looking at the chlorination, um, you know, is there a record of this working? So. In, in working uh, you, with New York State DEC on looking at alternatives for, for CSO, so we, we have been doing gray infrastructure, these large storage tanks, we've been doing green infrastructure, uh, but in some cases, even with building these massive storage tanks, they're periodically, you know, maybe once a month or so, there will be an overflow that, that can't be captured, it's just a heavy rainstorm. And the, the, the proposal now is to, when there is an overflow, is to uh, add sodium hydroxide, it's essentially strong um, Clorox bleach, to kill whatever bacteria may, may be in those overflows. Um, we, we also, part of that, those projects will include a dechlorination system using sodium bisulfide to remove any chlorine compounds before they, they may go into water bodies. And, and the concern about chlorine um, getting into waterways is that it can impact marine biota, and we want, we want to avoid that. So, it, we, we know it's going to be a challenge. We've looked at other municipalities that have done it. We will always, if we But how does, it, how does it work in those other municipalities? It, it's been challenging in other places. And, and what, what other municipalities have done and what we will do is default to 
having no, chlor no residual chlorine going into waterways. We may not get as much bacteria kill as, as we hope to achieve, uh, but we will always default to having no chlorine residual. Because Ali, Ali Pond, I know, has, you know, how many students? 75,000 students that sort of uh, go through APEC on a yearly basis. Um, so making sure we get that right for that particular ecosystem is, is uh, abundantly important. And, and, and we, you have your work, you, you'll be sort of keeping us updated on, because, you know, so that, you know, the, the old parable, the, the old lady who swallowed the fly, you know, at the end of, uh, end of the story, it doesn't go well for her. <laughs> no, we, we, we understand, and, 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 and as we progress the designs on these, we will be doing continual environmental review to, to just make sure that uh, these plans work going forward. Okay, I mean that, that you know I think we share a deep concern here that we want to make sure we get this right for the environment and for our, you know for the entire community in, in Eastern Queens. Um, so with that, uh, I'm going to come back. I have more questions, but I know that I have our chair. Oh, that's one more before I go. Uh, and I'm going to come back for a second round. Uh, also representing Bowery Bay, I know that there is a uh, directive as part of climate change and uh, you know, looking at extreme weather. Um, you know, I know that Bowery Bay is in a, in a, in a flood zone. I represent uh, a community that's got the power plants, the Bowery Bay sewage treatment plant. Um, there's sort of a lot of infrastructure in northwestern Queens um, that uh, needs hardening. Um, can you provide the committee an update with uh, where the agency is in respect to design, construction, and resiliency measures uh, at select pumping stations and other facilities across the city? So Barry Bay is one of our 14 wastewater treatment plants. All 14 of those plants were put right at the water's edge, and there was a reason that they were put there. We want sewage to flow downhill by gravity uh, to get to those plants. So they're all, uh, again, right along the water's edge, all susceptible to, to flooding uh, from, from, from storms and particularly sea level rise due to climate change. So we have been undertaking resiliency measures at all the plants. We had to do uh, work at several plants, uh, particularly along the South Shore after Sandy, to, to restore uh, some of the equipment that was damaged. But going forward, we have uh, over $300 million uh, in the plan to do things like hardening some of the infrastructure, raising electrical equipment, uh, just making sure that things are more resilient. About $300 million, you said? Uh, we have the yeah. number, John. Uh, yeah. I don't think it's, I think it's just <coughs> 300 million is correct. Okay. 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 And that's going to, and, and that's already in the budget, already being worked upon, and, and what's, what's the sort of target completion date for all of this work? Mr. Chair, those are in the budget for fiscal year 18 and 19, so they're in the process of being, uh, I believe contracts are prepared, um, being put out to bid, so it should be over the next couple of years. And as a wastewater treatment plants, um, I saw that you talked about you know, us being the third largest uh, municipal consumer of electricity. Are we looking at also um, uh, renewable energy opportunities at these plants? Um, and as we're looking to retrofit all city-owned buildings by, what is it, 2025 as part of the 1NYC plan, uh, what's our plan when it comes to these wastewater treatment plants to, to reduce our energy consumption? Yeah, definitely. It, it takes a lot of power to, to pump and treat 1.3 billion gallons a day of wastewater. And we've been looking at a number of initiatives, and one most particularly is using the, the methane gas that's produced in the wastewater treatment process as a fuel to power on-site generation. And we began a project last year at our North River plant uh, on the Upper West Side of Manhattan to put in cogeneration engines that'll use that renewable digester gas that's produced every day as a fuel to make electricity there. All right, well, I mean, as I was looking yesterday at the solar readiness report put out by DCAS pursuant to the local law that we passed, uh, and I saw that nothing at Bowery Bay was solar ready. Um, so I would love to see us figure out a way to sort of incorporate uh, Bowery Bay into renewable energy uh, opportunities uh, in the city. We'll take a look at that. Especially when we have all the emissions from the power plants in Western Queens, but 55% of the city's power is sitting not too far away from there. It'd be great if, you know, the city could lead the way on uh, emissions reductions in Western Queens. We're giving the power plants, uh, uh, holding them more accountable. All right, with that, I'm going to pass it over to my co-chair, uh, Vanessa Gibson, for questions. 
Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Commissioner, to you and your team for being here. And I guess just a few of my questions will obviously focus on just the capital um, work and the infrastructure of DEP and obviously the ongoing relationships that you maintain with um, other agencies as well as utility companies and uh, localities outside of the city of New York. So I first wanted to ask, uh, DDC plays a major role in a lot of your capital projects, and right now DDC is managing 482 of your capital projects, going through divisions like equipment, uh, sewers, water mains, treatment, water pollution control, and water supply. And so I wanted to ask, what actions does DEP take when you're working with DDC in terms of not only making sure that there is a productive working relationship, but more importantly, that projects are finished on time. So can you just give us an understanding of how that works? Sure, so Chair Gibson, um, DDC has, has the responsibility of doing a lot of street work for us. So uh, water mains and sewers primarily uh, that are below ground. And, and the reason that DDC manages those projects because there's often overlap with things that DOT needs to do or moving of utilities, and they really, DDC has the expertise to do that work. Um, we've done a lot of what we call upfront planning with them over the last couple of years, uh, just to make sure that everyone is on the same page with what needs to be done ahead of I issuing capital contracts to move forward. Um, and I, I, I think you know that's, that's borne some fruit over the last year or so, and um, there's been probably less uh, you know, delays in some of the work that they've been doing for us. But um, on, on, on installation of new water mains and, and sewers, I think you know, last couple of years, 17 and 18, we've uh, progressed fairly well. And at what point does DEP decide to bring DDC on board? Like, is it during the design phase or um, are there certain protocols that you have when you determine DDC should be involved? How does that work? Yeah, I, I think we, we typically default to them on any large water main or sewer work. Um, again, given if a street has to be ripped up to, to do that, uh, we know that DOT needs to be involved and you know, if there are gas lines in the street, electric lines, cable, um, it, 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 it's something that DEC, DDC just does very well. Okay, and do you think that it's useful to incorporate DDC during the design phase on all of these projects, or is that something that DEP would normally take up? So DEP normally does the design, but part of the upfront planning process is we, we will work with DDC and just explain to them what needs to be done, okay. um, how it will connect to other assets, and I think that that's worked out really well over the last couple of years. Okay, so in my opening I talked about the commitment rate and this subcommittee has obviously been looking at a number of agencies and the commitment rate, and I think DEP has done a fairly um, remarkable job of not only exceeding the city average, but looking at a lot of DEP projects and really making accurate projections, right? I think that's a challenge for a lot of agencies because there are a lot of unintended things that happen that we don't always foresee. So I wanted to specifically ask, in 2017, uh, DEP was able to commit 78% of its projects, um, but the previous year, there was a, a little bit of a dip to 68%. So I just wanted to understand, like, with that type of fluctuation, although it's not a major one, um, I've seen far worse, um, is, is there anything that explains that, and how do you maintain year to year some sort of an average of your commitment rate on some of your large projects? So we, we do have a large capital plan essentially every year, and it, it's really, it, it's planning uh, in the years before we get to that particular fiscal year. Uh, what projects do we need to do, and what do we reasonably expect we can uh, get contracts out the door in, a, in any particular year? And, um, you know, I, I think we're very realistic about what we can deliver, uh, so, so that goes up front. And then second is just holding the staff accountable to make sure that that happens. Uh, at DEP, we have senior level biweekly procurement meetings that I sit in on. Um, and we just go through schedules for procuring uh, all contracts, whether they be construction contracts, professional services, uh, other purchases, and we just make sure that we are on timelines to deliver those things. 
So within that structure, what do you think are some of the challenges that the agency may encounter in your ability to fulfill that commitment rate? Yeah, they, they, there can be a, a variety of, uh, of things, Chair Gibson. Um, it, it, there, there periodically are problems with, with vendors when they, you know, have to get, get their, their, now it's called passport, it used to be called Vendex approved. Uh, there are often questions that get raised at DOI or, or at MOX, and, and that can periodically delay, uh, you know, the vendor approval for, for months. Uh, there, there are, you know, internal problems with us just, just getting contracts, uh, you know, approved through the legal process that, that can delay things. Um, but again, we try, even before a particular fiscal year, to just make sure that, uh, you know, we have the capability of, of getting as close to 100% of our commitment as possible. Okay. And within a lot of the vendors you work with, I can imagine that your flexibility sometimes can be limited because there are a few number of companies that can actually do this major capital work. Um, are you looking at all at increasing the opportunities for additional vendors that may not necessarily have the long-standing relationship with the department, with the city, um, to try to achieve more of a balance? Um, you know, so obviously many agencies are, are looking at MWBE firms and other firms within the city that don't necessarily have the contracts with agencies, but could potentially do the work. Is that something that is on your radar in terms of ongoing conversation? It, it is. In, in, in some cases, there are just big contracts that can't be unwound into smaller ones. Right. Um, but we have been trying more and more to do that. And I, I personally, you know, being at DEP for a long time, always liked having smaller contracts rather than one large disruptive contract at a wastewater treatment plant that, that affects, you know, operations potentially. Just doing it in, in smaller pieces. And we've tried to do that uh, over the last couple of years. So if you look at our, our capital plan, I don't think you, you'll see any of those or, or many of those big, you know, multi-hundred million dollar projects, we've tried to, to break them into smaller pieces. One of the other things we've been looking at too, uh, when, when we hire professional services to do things, uh, in the past it had been a quality-based selection ex almost exclusively. So uh, when we need work, we'll have, through the RFP process, have people submit proposals, companies submit proposals. We'll look at them and, and just based upon the quality of the, the particular firm, what has been their experience in, in, in similar projects? Uh, how do they intend to do that work? Uh, and, and that often leaves out smaller firms who may not have that prior experience or expertise. What we're looking to do more now, instead of just purely quality-based, is a, a value-based. So we also want to look at what the price proposals are. You know, some, some smaller firms, they're, they're hungry to do work, and we may see lower costs. So going forward, we want to do uh, more of those, those value-based rather than just quality-based. Okay. selections for professional services. Okay. So this year's um, current commitment plan is about $2.6 billion. So do you expect to achieve even more of a commitment rate than last year? Are you guys aiming higher? How much do you expect to commit? Well, we, yeah, we, again, we, we meet bi-weekly. We just met uh, last, I don't know, was it last Monday? On Monday, Monday. Joe. We, we think we're going to be over 80%. We're still pushing to be over 80%. All so. right. Okay. I like when we aim high. <laughs> it's great. Okay. So uh, throughout a lot of the hearings, and, you know, as I mentioned, I was in Albany with colleagues yesterday, including the speaker. So we've been talking a lot about design build, and I wanted to find out, number one, your thoughts on design build. Um, is it beneficial to you? Have you used it on any other projects? And um, do you think that design build could be applicable to some of your ongoing work? We do. Um, th th there are certain types of work that we, we, we don't think design build is a good fit. They're just complex designs or, or things that, you know, we still need to, to you know, put, develop scope on as, as the designs go along. But there are some straightforward projects. We think like tunneling work. Uh, you know, tunnels are built all over the country, all over the world. There are firms with, with the expertise to do that. And so we think that type of work is, is certainly amenable to design build, and, and there are other projects as well. So we, we support it, and uh, we hope we get legislation to, to get approval to do it. Yeah. And what about the Kensico? Would that project? I just add to that really quickly. Okay. So sure. likely because of your help and advocation uh, up in Albany, uh, for the first time ever, our two projects are two of, I think, 10 or 12 that both the Senate and the Assembly have included in their one house bills as of last night. So. That's a huge accomplishment and something that we haven't seen Which before. Which projects? 
Uh, for us, it's the Kensico Eastview uh, tunnel connection and some uh, work that we're doing at Hillview. So two priority projects of the mayor that, again, are both included now in, in the legislative one house bill. So we're Great. very pleased. And the assembly is voting on their one house today. Wonderful. Okay, that's great. Great start. Um, I wanted to ask about the agencies and, you know, many times we've noticed that in terms of the budget lines, there really isn't an itemized list of some of the projects. So, for example, um, DEP has one budget line that includes the purchase of equipment for use by the DEP and mandated payments for private gas utility relocation, but it doesn't give any specifics. So it's like one sentence and a large amount, and then it doesn't give details. So I wanted to ask the department if that's something that you would be willing to consider. Uh, in terms of giving us a little bit more detail so we can understand some of the more individualized projects that fall under these budget items. And, and Joe, I'll turn it over to you because we Thank talked you. a little bit about this. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think there's a lot of merit to what you're proposing. I think the problem that we run into some of that, and particularly the uh, example that you used of the utility line, that is one of the ones that would probably be very difficult to break up because that's our agreement that we have with primarily with Con Ed and National Grid when they're doing street work and we're doing street work as well. We have a reciprocal agreement that we, you know, when they're doing work at our behest that we, uh, we reimburse them. And when we're, they're do when we're doing work at their behest, uh, uh, they reimburse us. So we go through and we true those up and, you know, it's a very, you know, large process that we go through every year and it's, you know, tens of millions of dollars. But there are, I think, a lot of other projects that we probably could start looking at and look at in terms of seeing how can we break them down further. And in particular, I think one of the things that we'd want to do is in probably working with, you know, you, your, the council and the staff is seeing how we perhaps could look at what's in the existing system of using the budget lines and the budget codes to be able to, you know, create more transparency in terms of what some of those projects are. Particularly for us, it becomes, you know, again, I'll, you know, I'll say where we have a lot of funds that we will allocate, you know, as lump sums because we don't know yet, like for emergency work, when we have to do emergency sewer um, or emergency water main construction, those we know happen for a certain amount every year of like $100 million, but we don't know where they're going to be happening until they do, you know, a break does occur. So those are other ones that may not lend themselves to that, but there is a lot of other ones that we can be working with the council, I think, in terms of creating more transparency into how we can, you know, make it more uh, visible to, to, you know, the council and other oversights in the public in terms of where our money is going to. Okay, no, I appreciate that. I think it's important for my colleagues and I because the average resident, the average New Yorker sees the work going on, the disruption, the impact on their everyday life, and they don't know whether it's utility, DEP, you know, they just don't know. So it's helpful for us, especially during the budget process, to further understand. So if it's not that particular budget item, if there are other suggestions the agency has, certainly we're amenable to further discussing that. I think the broader goal of, of all of the work is just to make sure that there is a system of um, open process where we can understand with the millions of dollars we're talking about, um, especially for projects that are more long term that you can project as compared to emergencies and things that happen where you have to go underground. I mean, we understand that. So where we can find areas of agreement on improvement, I think that we um, should be willing to do that. Definitely. Okay. So I have two final questions before I turn it back over to the chair. Um, the change order process. So I have a little bit of experience working for a general contractor, and we worked on million dollar contracts, and there were times when we had a change order. And at times that could you know, significantly impact the entire uh, process itself. So I wanted to understand your change order process and where you find challenges within that and how we can find areas of improvement. So change orders have historically been a challenge uh, for, for New York City in general. So just what is a change order? Um, when we issue a construction contract, there are certain specifications, certain requirements in the contract the contractor is expected to do. But periodically, when a contractor is on site actually doing the work, there is some field condition that may be slightly different that is not required in the contract. And so the contractor will say, if you would like me to do this, there will be a change order. So just one 
specific example, uh, I was at our 26th Ward wastewater treatment plant last month, and we have a contractor installing a new primary tank. He has to do excavation in a, in a, in a large patch. Came across an old 48-inch sewage pipe that may have been there for 100 years. Wasn't expected to be there, so it wasn't in his contract to remove. And he said to us, if you'd like me to remove this pipe, I will need money and a change order. The, the change order process in itself can take months to get approved, and that often slows up projects because a contractor can say, I'm not gonna remove that pipe until I'm assured that you're gonna pay me, and it, 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 again, it can take weeks, if not months, to get change orders approved, and that's been a significant challenge. It, it has to go through several levels of, of approvals. It's it just the on-site engineer can't say, yes, that, that pipe is there, please remove it for $10,000. It, it's got to go all the way, in many cases, to even get a controller registration. And the change order process is approved by M uh, OMB? So if, if we have a change, if we identify, I need to remove this, this buried pipe that was there, we didn't know it was there, and the contractor says it's going to cost X, and we say, well, it's going to cost Y, we negotiate a price. Mm -hmm. It's got to go through several levels of approvals, and I don't know, Joe, yeah. you can talk about okay. those. Yeah. Yeah, there will be some, in, you know, again, um, council member, and you're probably familiar somewhat, it depends on what the scope of the contract was. And, you know, in most of the construction contracts, there is some degree of contingency built in. So you will be able to go and get those component pieces that are under the contingency amount through the process somewhat quicker. But if you've had more than one or numerous change orders that may occur on a construction contract, which is often can happen, mm -hmm. you would then at that point have to be able to go back to OMB and you know the controller's office to get the registration you know process from there. So it depends on the magnitude and the, the the of both the change order as well as the project itself. You know, on smaller ones, it's you know could be a small amount that could trigger the change order on the larger ones and over many years, you may not have it triggered early on, but it could happen over the course of time. And then as you're getting towards the end, that's when they start compounding. And that becomes, I think, when some of the pressure happens because you don't, you know, you're, you're getting it towards the final stages of it. One of the things that we're looking at to improve this is one area there where you could have scope changes that were not anticipated, either planned or unplanned. We're trying to be much more diligent in the engineering process of looking at those projects as they go forward, and also while it's developing to say, when do those occur, and when does it require a change order, and that we could, as much as possible, try to anticipate it before the contract is even bid, and then during the course of the contract, it may say, this is work that is outside the scope, and we may have to hold, do a whole new contract from there. And making that decision, we think, may also improve the process as well, because it'll tighten up our control over, you know, what's happening on that contract. Right. So do you typically have funding that is projected for these change orders? No, we, 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 if we have it in that specific contract, you know, we will, it's, it's on the CP level, but it's okay. not at the budget level. So we will go through during the course of the, the year, and that's Got one it. of the areas where, um, as you look at the commitment rate and you see, you know, that we commit 80%, those that other 20% not committed is where we would draw funds from, you know, during the course of the year to say, oh, we need to fund this change order. So that's where we'll use where there is some flexibility within the, the budget to be able to use available resources to cover some of those change order costs. Okay. And my final question is as it relates to all of the upstate work that the department does, maintaining relationships with local governments. I was a former assembly member, so many of those county legislators I know, they all came from the assembly. Um, how do you work with the local governments, with landowners and property owners, where you're going under their property? What, what does that relationship look like? And in terms of the workforce, do you have a unit at DEP that's focused on working with like upstate county legislators? How does that work? We, we do, and that's it, been a historical challenge because when New York City built some of its reservoirs, you know, more than 100 years ago, we, we bought out a lot of property owners. We picked up some towns and moved them elsewhere, and there's still a lot of hard feelings in some of these communities, but I think we've worked hard, uh, specifically through the filtration avoidance process, is to make sure that the needs of those communities and, de and, and the, the, the water supply for New York City is met. And, um, our, you know, folks uh, it, that, that work upstate uh, and live upstate, I think have done a great job over the last 15, 20 years in 
reestablishing some of those relationships and working closely with those municipalities. Um, you, you mentioned some of the work um, that, that we're doing uh, for the Kensco Eastview Connection, this right. possible design build that we want to do, um, and also the, the Delaware Aqueduct Repair right. where we are. Again, we've needed easements from, from several property owners uh, to, to do work under their properties. And you know, I think explaining to them what the work is, we, we, we've, we've, we've come a long way from where we were, I'm going to say, 20 years ago. Oh, definitely. Okay. Well, thank you, Commissioner. I really appreciate it. And like I mentioned, I think the department is doing a great job. And in my capacity chairing this subcommittee, I certainly want to work with you on best practices, on improvements in budget items, and, and certainly the ongoing relationships, the interagency partnerships that you have with DDC as well as utility companies. Um, certainly want to thank you for your work and keep that commitment rate up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Chair. Thank you, Chair Gibson. Uh, before I pass it to uh, Councilmember Grudenchik, I do want to ask one question that my, my colleague sent me via text. Uh, relating to uh, the, the, the announcement of the feasibility study in January or July of 2017 uh, relating to the groundwater drainage project in southeast Queens, uh, I know that you know, the groundwater there has been rising consistently, <coughs> causing basement uh, flooding. I know that Donovan Richards, I know, will talk a little bit further probably about that. Um, but wanted to get a sense of, it says that it will be completed, the study radial uh, collection study will be completed by spring of 2018. Well, spring's about to start in seven days, though it doesn't feel like it outside. Uh, what part of the spring do you anticipate it being done? <laughs> so, so I'll give a bit of a preview. So it, it just a, as background, um, water was provided uh, in, in many parts of Queens from the Jamaica water supply through the 1990s. So groundwater was was drawn and and, and distributed, uh, but but over the last you know I guess 10 years or so we've we've stopped using all groundwater uh, from southeast Queens from Queens in general and provided water to those residents from from upstate water supplies from from the reservoir surface waters. And so what has happened is the groundwater has started to, to creep up over time, and some homeowners are actually seeing groundwater getting into their, their basements. Um, you know, we've, 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 we've seen some businesses complaining that they have to periodically pump and homeowners. So we've looked at a bunch of alternatives. One is to continue to pump groundwater and, and not provide it as drinking water, but just to waste. And our neighbors in Nassau County have a concern with that because they use the groundwater supply as their primary source of drinking water, and they would like to keep as much of it in the aquifers as possible. DEC has some concerns about pumping. So we started looking at, and we call this this, this radial groundwater study, is not, not actually using pumps, but just using gravity to peel off a certain amount of groundwater and bring it to places like Alley Pond. So we've done some modeling, some, some assessment, and it looks like we, there, there, there may be some areas where we can re reduce levels of, of groundwater in certain specific areas. And uh, again, we're putting the report together now. I've seen some drafts, and, and we, we'll have that done within a couple of months. Do we, do we think we'll be able to get that done for FY19, or at least there'll be some of that happening in this fiscal year, and what would that cost? So, so the, the, the report, and I don't remember offhand, the, re, the report did have some costs uh, in it for various levels of these, these essentially radial arms. Um, I, off the top of my head, I don't remember, but we'll, we'll have that report done. Like I said, it, I, I saw a intermediate draft, I guess I'll call it, in the last couple of weeks. And I think there's an opportunity for us to rehabilitate some of that water for drinking use during the, the, you know, the possible shutdown of, of the roundabout uh, the West Tunnels? Yeah, so the, the, the one of the things that we had looked at is during the, the period of time uh, in late 2022, early 2023, when we have to sh shut down the, the Round Out West Branch um, leg of the Delaware Aqueduct and to make the, the connection from the parallel tunnel, we said, will the city have enough water supply uh, just coming from the, the Catskill Aqueduct and from Croton? Uh, would we need other sources of water like the old Queens groundwater wells, the wells are still there. Um, we, we think that without uh, putting those wells back into service, we will, con we will have enough water supply from those other sources while the tunnel is shut down. We will be able to, to mitigate the flooding in southeast Queens that's coming from this groundwater based on this radio collection. 
to, to, to a small degree, yes. It, it won't, not everyone is gonna be happy, but uh, there are areas where groundwater by gravity can be uh, reduced and, and carried away. I, I look forward to hearing more because this is gonna be money well spent for those homeowners and, and the, the, the residents in Southeast Queens. Uh, with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Councilman, not Gorodnik, but Gordenchik. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair, Madam Chair. Uh, good, still morning. Good morning, Commissioner. Uh, Chair uh, Gibson, I just want to let you know that the ACCO at DEP is a former colleague of mine, Alisa Velasquez, who uh, I had the pleasure of working with when she was the general counsel to uh, Borough President Melinda Katz. Uh, she's outstanding. She's a former general counsel at Mox, and she's also my constituent, so, and a good friend. So we're in good hands there, and she doesn't take, she is, Tough as nails. She doesn't take uh, guff from anybody, except from the commissioner, of course. Um, commissioner, a couple of quick things. We are, uh, I was gonna talk about chlorination, I might still. We, um, you're dismantling on Springfield Boulevard, just south side of the Grand Central Parkway, that uh, large storage tank that's been there since as long as I can remember, which is uh, 58 years. Um, do you have any other plans to do that? I know that my district, um, Councilman Richards and others, Councilman Miller, Councilwoman Adams, Councilman Ulrich, we cover the former Jamaica water supply. So uh, one, do you have plans to get rid of other facilities like that? And two, maybe more importantly, uh, if you get rid of those uh, storage tanks and other amenities that come with a water system, Will you be disposing of any of that land back to other agencies or to the public? So that's my first question. So these are, for the old Jamaica water supply that drew groundwater, the, the, the water was primarily pumped into those storage towers. Uh, we've taken some down, the one in Springfield we're taking down. Um, I'm gonna look, Ch Tassos Georgelis, who's our, our deputy commissioner for water and sewer operations, if he's got some additional information. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so we do have plans for two or three, I think, that we're looking at now, and we're always going to evaluate the rest of them to see if they're unsafe and if we should be taking them down. I mean, there are very large ones in Holliswood. Um, they're, they're much bigger, I believe, um, than the one that you're taking down currently. I don't have a problem with you taking them down. I haven't gotten a single complaint. A couple of people have called and asked what's going on, and I've seen the removal of the paint, which is being done in an environmentally uh, sensitive way. I just want to make sure that we're informed so because, you know, we always, the constituents always know before the elected officials because they live right there. So um, I would appreciate uh, any of that. And I'm sure my colleague, Mr. Richards, will have other questions about, um, about groundwater in Southeast Queens. I would ask you this question, though. Uh, if you're planning on peeling off some of that water to Alley Pond, which does have any number of vernal ponds and uh, waterways in it, that mostly sits on top of the terminal moraine, and would you have to pump the water up? I don't know if I mentioned Alley Pond. It's, you did uh, say Alley Pond. Maybe you meant Basely Pond. I meant Basely. Okay. Um, and lastly, on the chlorine, I am very concerned, certainly, I, I've been following this issue uh, since I first got into government, because I was working for Assemblywoman Mayerson in the late 80s um, when we started to talk about this, and I attended some of the very first meetings with DEP um, regarding the outflow into uh, the, the CSO, which is currently um, uh, next to uh, College Point Boulevard, and uh, we have, they were gonna be baseball fields, now they're soccer fields, that's how long it took. Uh, my question with the chlorination, um, I am concerned that we get it all, uh, or at least as much as all as is feasible, and I, I would rather delay that to see that whatever technology you need to find to be able to do that. Uh, we've worked very, very hard, as you know, to restore uh, Little, uh, Little Neck Bay, the alley. Um, it's thriving now. It's a big fishery. It's, it's a lot of people crab there. I don't want them to be eating the chlorine as well. I know that uh, it's a balance that you have to take, uh, but is it, what, is, what are the currently the level of chlorine that you'll be able to take out of the bleach, as you call it? So, yeah, it's, the, the chlorine that we'll be adding will be sufficient to um, kill many of the pathogens that 
would otherwise be in those uh, CSO releases. But um, the, the process to add sodium bisulfite, which is a dechlorinator, uh, we think can get the chlorine residual down very low. Um, at, at the testing at some of our wastewater treatment plants, we're able to get the residual chlorine down to tenths of a part per, per million. Um, you know, we often say, uh, you know, our drinking water often contains, you know, more than is acceptable to go into to waterways uh, because the marine biota are more sensitive. Um, but, but, but again, when, when we eventually build these systems, if that's the, the, the path forward, uh, we would always default to having less of a bacteria kill uh, to avoid having any residual chlorine leak into those waterways. Is it a solid that you use, or is it a liquid, or is it a gas? It's a, it's a liquid bleach. It, it's just Clorox in a, in a slightly stronger form. Okay. All right, thank you, Commissioner, and it's, uh, it's been a pleasure to work with you, and I want to thank your staff for being fairly responsive. We are still waiting for the study on 188th Street. We're all the, uh, so if you could get to that, I would, <laughs> before this uh, spring runs out, um, it's been a little while now, so I appreciate that. So thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Chairman. I'm gonna run thank you, Councilmember Member Garodna. Uh, <laughs> good night. Good night, Chick. I, I, I love you, brother. I, I see Keith Powers, and, and it messed me up. I'm, I'm so, so sorry. Uh, Councilmember Member uh, uh, That said, uh, we've been joined by Councilmember Powers of Manhattan, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it over for Donovan Richards uh, for questions, and I'll find a hole to crawl into. <laughs> Thank you, Councilmember Costa Khan. How do you say your last name? I'm messing with you, Costa. It took me like a year to get that right. <laughs> um, thank you, and I want to thank the chairs uh, for this hearing. I uh, wanted to ask some quick questions, so let's go into the catch basins. So obviously we passed Local Law 48, in which you were supposed to clean out all 148,000 street catch basins. Did we achieve that goal? We did, so last year, Council Member... Uh, Fell a little short last year, right? Fiscal 18, we, we, okay. we got to about 99%. I mean, okay. there, were, there were some catch basins that we just physically couldn't get to for a variety of reasons. Sometimes cars were parked over them, but... Well, we got very close to the, the 100 percent, and I, I just want to say, you know, we, we said in the testimony, it's really been a terrific program. I mean, it's been more work for us, um, but we've been able to remove material more quickly before the basins get filled. We've been able to, uh, you know, address repairs when they are small before they get large. Um, How many defective basins did you find? Do we have that number? Do you have that, Casas, or defective basins? Defective. Want to come up? All right. Yeah. Come on up. Come on down. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. I think you have to state your name for the record. So when, when we say you defective... You have to state your name for the record, I think, too. Uh, Tassos, you're jealous. So w when we say... Uh, Defective. We have two categories. One are the ones that are non-functioning, and then the ones that need a repair but it still function. So, in in the last report, I think it was somewhere about uh, between two and three thousand were non-functioning, mm -hmm. but for repairs, it's going to be a, a few thousand more. So, I think it's around three percent. We found. And we've made repairs to needed, all of those. Needed repairs. You made repairs to it, all of those. So we work on the ones that are non-functioning first, okay. the, the priority ones that need safety. The ones with smaller repairs, just because the number and volume of work that we've seen has increased, it's taken us a little longer to get to, but we're working on it as fast as we can. Mm -hmm. All right, good. I mean, we would love to see numbers. It just gives us a little bit more. And, and, and what I'd like to add, council member, as well, is we've started to now see complaints for catch basin issues come down, um, yep. and, and that's been terrific as well. Yeah, and that's what the purpose of the local law was for. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Samara. Um, wanted to go into, um, so just speak a little bit about coordination amongst the agencies. So obviously we're seeing a lot of work done, and I wanna thank you, Commissioner. Um, I know it's been a long time to get here, uh, taking a long time to get here. Um, can you speak to the coordination amongst the agencies, DDC? And then um, one of the holdups that historically has really kept projects from moving forward was DOT, right? Because they needed to have money in their budget. So can you speak to uh, what that coordination looks like? I know I recently met with DDC. They acknowledge I think they have a whole unit now dedicated to Southeast Queens. 
are you part of those conversations or and, uh, can you speak to just coordination on phase council member we are we, we, we essentially now have daily conversations uh with with ddc but um you're right a lot of it is just initially up front coordinating uh work that that needed to be done we wanted to make sure that where we were intending to put sewers in dot didn't just put in a new uh street or repave and and we would rip that up so We've done a lot better uh, upfront planning with, with DDC just to make sure that, that everything uh, has been coordinated. And you know, as, as you've noted, work over the last year or two has really started to ramp up and, mm -hmm. and move forward. Um, okay, last two questions. Um, I'll, I'll go into air quality. Well, let, let me go to groundwater quick. So when do you anticipate the study? I know you went into a little bit um, uh, on the groundwater. Uh, what has the study found so far? Right, so, I mean, so, could you go into some yeah. tidbits? And, and what areas are do you think we will look at right. to address these areas? I, I know you can't get into the whole thing, but sp that, can you identify yeah. specifically? So, so just quickly, the, the the intent of the study to, was to look at is uh, are there areas mm -hmm. of Southeast Queens where groundwater levels are above even though you say it's still it's below the ground but are higher mm -hmm. than some local waterways like Baisley Pond mm -hmm. so if if that's the case there may be the ability to put in just a pipe that by gravity would collect that groundwater below a homeowner's basement or or equivalent to a homeowner's basement level and just by gravity have that water drain into again Baisley Pond or another natural would be no water course, course to the homeowner and there would be no cost to the homeowner. Okay. Again, we're looking at, in, in the report, you know, we, 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 we're looking at a bunch of different areas. In some areas, it looks like this radial system will work, and others where we will hopeful it, it, it wouldn't. Um, and we're you now starting to develop, you know, what, what the cost may look like. But um, again, we should have that. I, I, I saw a draft of the report about, I don't know, two weeks ago, and should be out soon. Yeah, I think the plan is to meet with local stakeholders, elected officials, community board folks, people that we've been talking about this over the past few years and okay. present the results and then have it public. Okay, awesome. Uh, last question just on air quality complaints. So I think there's been an increase we've seen uh, over the last four months. Um, can you speak to why uh, we're closing out air, comp air um, quality complaints mm -hmm. um, less frequently? than we used to, yeah. what are the challenges? Yeah, and I'll ask Deputy Commissioner Licata to, to come up and she manages our air noise uh, and asbestos unit. Good morning, good afternoon. I'm not sure what time it is right now. Um, so with respect to noise complaints, we have seen a slight uptick. Oh, I didn't ask about noise, but that's good yeah, to hear I too. Understand. How are we addressing both of them now? I haven't seen the <laughs> uptick in the air complaints as, as significantly as we've seen an uptick in noise complaints. Um, but the, uh, w what we do with inspectors mm -hmm. for um, the air and the noise unit is we have been increasing our use of technology. Mm -hmm. um, and just, you know, speaking of the uptick, it's a little difficult to see that as a trend necessarily, although we have seen um, in the past several years a clear increase in complaints associated with after hour construction. So there is no doubt that we believe that there is um, a construction boom and that's relating um, to the increase in the um, number of complaints. Mm -hmm. And, and, we're, yeah. and we're still at that number, roughly around 40 or 50 inspectors for the city? Is we any? have now, and, and so the commissioner is showing me that, in fact, the four-month uh, year-over-year for air quality complaints has actually come down. That's why I got, got a little oh. confused. Um, but I wouldn't look at that as too much of a significant trend in terms of the increase or the decreases. I would say that we have a lot of complaints with respect to air and to noise quality. I think the improvement that we made with respect to the local law um, 53, I think it is um, increasing our authority under the noise code to enforce against um, noise mm -hmm. uh, will be extremely helpful. So that piece of legislation I'm really excited about um, the 
possibilities associated with implementing that. I think that's both uh, sensible legislation that allows for our inspectors to have certainty because they'll have an absolute noise level standard at the street level, but also will allow the regulated community to have a better understanding of what they really need to do to mitigate their noise, to have acceptable noise levels um, on the ground. And your average days to close out has increased. Yes, so. there was an uptick in the average days um, t to close out. Uh, however, not really looking at that as a uh, large alarm. We did go back and look at those numbers, and we actually found that there was an open ticket. This is our jargon, but there was an open um, ticket in Manhattan, which was really a paperwork um, issue. So we were able to close that down. Once you closed out that particular job, the average Just days. Just one ticket closes? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was open for a year. <laughs> so once we took that out, we actually normalized the data, and there's not too much of an uptick at this point. But what I was saying um, earlier is that we were, we're looking now at the uh, possibilities of technology, mm -hmm. and so one improvement that we've made is to give our inspectors in the field, these um, 62 inspectors plus uh, supervisors, have access to handheld tablets. Mm -hmm. So they'll have more um, immediate information at their fingertips. The other thing we're experimenting with now is um, a heat map. So as we get those 311 complaints, we're able to look at those. If they look like they're geographically clustered, we can send somebody out right away to say, okay, what's going on? And that becomes a more real-time response. Okay. okay, well, thank you. And I want to thank the commissioner really, truly for the work that we're doing uh, in our community. And, you know, we can see the results. We have still have a long way to go, but we, we cannot... I can't sit here and say there's been no progress. So we look forward to our continued uh, partnership with you over the next uh, four years or so to, to get this done. Great, and thank you for your support and pressure. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Council Member Richards. I just want to quickly piggyback on something that both Chair Gibson and, and Councilmember Richards talked about, which was uh, the catch basins. Uh, when it's work done by DDC on behalf of DEP, like replacing water mains, uh, do we go back and inspect the uh, catch basins post work to make sure that they're up to par? Because right now there's a huge project going on in Astoria where we're replacing water main and the, the catch basins along those streets are in horrid, horrid condition. Um, and I hope that we're not going to wait a year to then go back out and inspect them after this work's been done. No, that's, that's, that's a great point, Mr. Chair, and uh, that's been a challenge for us when there's any kind of street work, whether it's installing, uh, you know, new subsurface infrastructures or even, um, you know, mill remilling and paving of, of roadways is, w w I think we have to do a better job of going and inspecting our, you know, catch basin infrastructure once the work is done. All right, so I guess I'll, I'll be sending you some information relating to those particular. I wanted to make sure what our coordination is with DDC to make sure when that work is done, do we go out and inspect or how does it, you know, they, they're supposed to bring things back to code when they finish the work. How do we how do we spot check to make sure that they're you know, that the catch basins are part of that? Yeah. So so under the con the contracts require the, the the person doing the work is to actually protect those catch basins, and they're supposed to put silk silt fabrics or other devices over the catch basins to prevent material from from getting in. Um, but you know during busy construction things can happen, and it it it's you know DEP should ultimately be looking at those basins after work is done. All right, great. Thank you. Well, I'm going to continue to, to follow up with you about that because it's right now the the entirety of the street's in bad shape, but the catch basins do not look in good condition. And even after the work's done, they do not look in good condition. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Councilmember uh, Helen Rosenthal from Manhattan. Thank you so much, Chairs. Um, welcome, Commissioner. I actually am um, going to be asking questions with my member of the subcommittee on capital budget hat on. Um, although I want to start by asking, where can members of the public get the water bottle that you guys <laughs> are displaying, and is it BPA free? Yeah, so we periodically, periodically have events where we hand them out, and I don't know where's the, uh, the best place to, Mario, to... I'm just saying, maybe when you're testifying in front of the... Yeah, well, we'll, 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 okay. you know, we'll bring Okay, so um, I noted, I, I really want to compliment you on page nine in your testimony. You were talking about your cost savings initiatives. Um, and, uh, I mean, the one about 
glycerol is just great, a 50% reduction. That's astounding. Um, and then the operational systems, that, that seems meaningful. But, I, but let's transfer that thinking to the capital, to capital contracting. Um, have you identified ways to capture savings on the capital side through procurement changes? So when we're developing a, a capital contract, um, we, we generally will work with, uh, you know, design professionals to determine um, what, what equipment is the most efficient, meaning that has, you know, lowest um, <coughs> energy use or, or emissions, um, and, and we look at life cycle costs as well. So we're looking at, you know, a piece of equipment may be slightly more expensive, but it uses much less energy. So while, while doing that work, while identifying the equipment that's going to be installed under the capital contracts, we're, we're generally always looking at those so, types of things. Right. What I'm talking about, that's great. Yeah. I appreciate you. Um, what I'm talking about is literally in the process of procurement where you can find savings. So, for example, Passport, uh, and I am the former chair of the Committee on Contracts, was supposed to result in savings, uh, reductions in costs, because the capital contracting process, or any contracting process, would be faster and easier. And I heard what I heard you say about where the, um, uh, where things get stopped, n not changing or not being fixed with Passport. In other words, it still gets stuck in DOI or law department or MOCs. So I think some of the changes that have been made in procurement have helped, and, and Passport, I think, in overall has helped the process. It's just that when information in Passport raises a red flag, you know, company has whatever, some prior history of something. Um, I'm very of, proud of those red flags. I think they named them red flag because I kept calling them red flag. <laughs> Not that I'm the only person who does that. But it's critical for your agency, in my mind's eye, because my guess is there aren't that many bidders. And, and, and that's a great point. So some of the larger work we're doing, if we're for the $20 million, $50 million, $100 million project, we see few bidders, and particularly with the economy good and a lot of companies busy with other projects, uh, we, we, we often, in some cases, we get, we've had a couple where we've had two bidders. Um, What's the most number of bids you've had? What type of project gets the most number of bids? Uh, the, the, the smaller stuff we do. So if it's so some of the, the water and sewer work, if we're doing a small above ground structure, we'll get a lot of bids. Some of the maintenance work we do at our wastewater treatment plants where we're replacing simple equipment, pumps or piping. How we, many is a lot? We, 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 on some, we get eight to 10 bids in some cases. In some more complex work we do, we only get two bids. And like I said, and it's, a lot of the bigger companies are very busy with other work throughout the city, throughout the world, and... Do you uh, compete with the MTA for tunneling, for example? We all do this. There's a very small number of companies that do that specific type of work, and um, when we, we, we looked at uh, the, the um, Delaware Aqueduct Bypass Tunnel that we bid, I guess it's two years ago now, um, it's contract BT2, $707 million project, there are very few companies that can do $707 million tunnel jobs, and that's what we face periodically. But again, we've been trying over time, uh, council members, to, to break down contracts into to smaller bites. Um, and, and the other thing, too, I think, as, as everybody knows, the, the, the uh, bids have been coming in higher in the last couple of years. Uh, we've seen some stability, I guess, in, in fiscal 18, but fiscal I mean, 16 and 17. My concern is so. that part of the reason they're coming in higher is because there's something about the procurement system that actually keeps multiple firms from getting engaged. Mm -hmm. 
I've heard from companies, as it has to do with the MTA, um, who do um, subway work for Philadelphia, Boston, New Jersey, but won't bid on MTA contracts because of the procurement rules that have, uh, you know, come up over time that are basically biased toward some firms. So that, um, and certainly this was the situation, and um, Mr. Deloach is very familiar with this because he was incredibly helpful, but with the DOE contract that was 600 million, where there was 600 million of fluff, it was there because of how the procurement was written. Once we wrote it differently so that there was not a single provider, you know, because there was really only one provider who could do what the city was asking for, in truth, the city didn't need that provider at all. And once that was cleaned up, the contract went from 1.2 billion down to 450 something million dollars. So what I'm, that's what I'm trying to yeah. get at. So, so a couple of things. One is, you know, when we, we put together our contract specs, we try to make sure that um, the, the, the process is competitive, where there will be multiple firms. We don't just, you know, look at one particular firm um, on that. It, but, but just in, in general, you know, some of the, the city's rules for insurance and bonding make it tough for, for, for companies, well, it, the payment process, it often takes a long time to issue payments to companies, and ooh. that boxes out some so smaller firms. Passport, if you get them in the finance portal, is gonna end that. So are your contracts in the finance portal yet, or are they only in for RFP? Um, RFPs. I, would, I believe they're, you know, we're in just uh, this, I don't think we're in the pass, uh, the payment portal. But I'll have to so get. I would urge you to get in there because it's a tired excuse for contractors to say that they have to bid higher because we don't pay. That's no longer true. And so to the extent that your ACOs can become facile on this, you will save the city money or we need you to be pushing harder when you're putting out bids to make sure that you're wiping out the fluff that's in there for late payments. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and, and I didn't mean to say that, that they were bidding higher because of, of the time it takes to get paid, but it, it does box out some smaller firms who can't front that money So what to I'm pay saying is that shouldn't be happening anymore. Yeah that to the extent that you can get them the contract, they should be invoicing and getting paid within three months. And the city is also willing, they've done this with the human service contracts, to uh, you know, prepay for contracts we know we're going to sign, and that's simply a matter of timing. Did you want to add anything? And, I, well, and thank you for that, council member. Yes, and I think that model is something we have not used on the construction side. I think it's an interesting concept that we would probably like to explore. I mean, and if I think that's we'll what would bring in smaller companies and start to drive down costs, that would strike me as something that could be a top priority for DEP. I would add, though, that there is a degree of complexity that we also had to be cognizant of, which is- Of course. Yeah, when you have a human It service. took me four years to understand contracts. I get complexity. No, 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 I, I, but, but I'm and saying- And I get the fact that there is minutia in every field yeah. that makes it different. We have to get over that. It's time to interrupt that thinking. That is true in every area of business. So that cannot be a hurdle you can't get over. And I agree, and I think we have to bring our game up, and that's, I will speak to Councilman Gorodnicic, who is left, but Grenchek. where we have, Grenchek, But I, I get apologize. that, Gorodnicic. But uh, where, you know, our, our ACO is bringing that to bear, and we're working closely with all of our bureaus, especially on the contracting side, I think one of the big things that the commissioner alluded to is upfront, where we're doing better planning, I think, now, 
and we're also doing better scope development. Exactly, it's and what I need you to do on the capital budget side is translate that into savings. Even if it's savings that, um, here's my concern, that all of that good, critical, and of course, that's your job, so all of that work is translating into savings. And what I am concerned about is the bidders who are used to getting $500 million contracts still think they should be getting $500 million contracts when you, through your good scoping and no longer having to have as many change orders, et cetera, have really brought the cost of that contract down to $450 million. Right. And I need you to demonstrate to the taxpayers that you're capturing that savings. We need yes. you to do that. And I don't, I, I, it would be extraordinary if DB, DEP could lead the way on literally tracking that. And you could do that now through Passport. Yeah, and we're working, tool. and we will work with the system, and we will work with, you know, our oversights, which includes both, you know, MOX, um, OMB, and ultimately the controller as well, to, you know, get those savings there. And I think we're, we're working towards that, and we will get there, and we work for, look forward to working with the council on that as well. Yeah, it would be great to see that as a, for our capital subcommittee, to see that as an indicator at next year's budget hearing. So I'm just putting that out there. Two last quick questions. Does DEP have a role in fixing ponding? Street ponding from, from storm runoff, yes. So uh, there are- Can I bring you out to 10 sites in my district? Not sure. Yes. Yeah, so That's all I want to know. The, we, we will go out and take a look. Thank at, you. Because uh, um, DEP isn't, I mean DOT isn't helping. So I'd love to find another agency that could help me with ponding. And lastly, I'm wondering, um, uh, and this is just totally, I'm back to, sorry, chairs, a different issue. So stay with me for one second. And now I'm just putting on my mirror council member hat. Do you have the capacity, the, um, the uh, software networking capacity to know by address whether or not the complaints that you have inspectors going to and, and resolving can be connected with the Department of Buildings. So in other words, the Buildings Department and also HPD, mm -hmm. you can look up an address, see the complaints. But I'm thinking about tenants that have complaints that fall into all the agencies. Is there any way from your side to connect by address with DOB or HPD or DOF? for that matter. Yeah, I'm not sure if we do. I'm gonna to look to my folks. It's, all right, I'm gonna ask Cecil McMaster, who's our Chief Information Officer, to come up. Great, and we can follow up on this after I realize it's a little off topic, so my apologies. Yeah, so I'm Cecil McMaster, CIO for DEP. Yes, we could connect to the other agencies by address. Oh, you are my new favorite friend. <laughs> can I have your card and can we meet and discuss that? Yes. Oh, that really ended on a high note. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal. We're joined by Councilmember Yeager from Brooklyn. And now for questions, Councilmember Powers. Thank you. I'm going to be quick because I apologize I have to leave. I think he just got a raise, by the way. Uh, and thank you, Commissioner, for being here and the team from DEP. I, I, you guys have a, a sometimes unnoticed mandate in the city, and I know you do an important job for, for all of us. And I share Councilmember Rosenthal and others, uh, you know, questions about cost savings, but also the work you're doing. So I appreciate it. I just, uh, on the cost savings side, I, I note that you have some stuff around the reduction of chemical costs and on, on the operating side. And some, some time ago in a former life of mine, I actually worked with a very good team you have at DEP at one of the wastewater plants around uh, looking at uh, magnesia actually as a replacement chemical. So you actually, I think, were at the initial meeting of it pre-being pre commissioner. Um, I, I, I want to know two things. First of all, that I think it was 
Jerry Fergius, Art Spangle, that team was was fantastic, and I, I hope they're I hope they're all still there and they're great. Um, and one of them's a constituent of the chair, by the way. But um, uh, so I wanted to do that plug. I still think sometimes the staff goes unnoticed. But uh, is that factored into? Is that program still happening? Is that pilot still going on, or probably not pilot anymore? And is that factored into your? I, I note that because I know, also remember that some of the folks who worked there um, appreciated having something that was safer than the existing product that would not cause uh, uh, safety concerns for the so staff. I'll give a little background, then I'm going to ask Pam Alardo, our uh, Deputy Commissioner for Wastewater Treatment, to come up. But um, to do pH adjustment on our plants, we've long used um, sodium hydroxide. It's, it works very well, um, but, but it can be corrosive. And so we've looked at magnesium hydroxide. I know we've done a pilot. And Pam, yeah. do you know what so uh, good morning. It's, I'm Pam Allardo. I'm Deputy Commissioner for the Bureau of Wastewater Treatment. Great to meet you all. Uh, yes, uh, we're constantly looking at different ways to use the best chemicals, the most cost-effective chemicals, and the safest. So magnesium hydroxide is a perfect example of that. We did do a pilot in one of the treatment plants. I'm pushing that as a reportable metric to me on a quarterly basis is how we're going to roll that out to the other plants. Fortunately, it doesn't take a lot of additional infrastructure or additional costs. It might be some new uh, piping systems, um, relatively straightforward, um, not new tankage, but overall it's going to be cheaper, it's more effective, and uh, safer for, for our employees. And, and on top of that, we, we, we research advantages throughout for our industry all the time, and we also take employee input, and a lot of times an employee will come up with why are we using this chemical, and uh, concerns about safety will really drive us towards the most cost effective and safe, safest solutions. Great, thank you. Thanks so much. I'm sorry I have to leave early, but thanks. Thanks for the questions. Thank you, Councilmember Powers. Um, just quickly, um, talking about facility security checks. <clears throat> uh, according to the mayor's MMR, uh, the number of facility checks has decreased from 98,528 in the first four months of fiscal 17 to 89,606 during the same period in fiscal 18. Um, what's, what's the rationale for those uh, the decreasing in checks? Yeah, so, Mr. Chair, um, New York City DEP is the only municipal water supplier in the country that has its own police force. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, 200 officers who patrol our, our, our watershed territories and do those uh, security checks. Uh, over, over the past year, uh, we've had some attrition there in the police force. Uh, some, some members have, have left to go to other municipalities. They live upstate and they've, they've joined police forces there. But fortunately, we have 38 uh, new officers who are going through our academy right now. Um, and this spring, they will be out at the sites. And having that new class of 38 will get our numbers back up to where they need to be. So once we, so that's all we'll need is those 38, or we need to add more of a head count? Once we're at 38, we will be at full head count. And then we'll be back to our full 200, and then we'll have the ability. Um, so what is our, and I don't want to know the details of it, right? So I'm just asking if it, if it exists. Um, we can talk offline of what it actually is. Um, but does the department currently have a terrorism action plan? Uh, so if something does go wrong at the water supply, yeah. we do have some sort of plan in place to deal with that, correct? We, we do, both terrorism and counterterrorism as well. Uh, to, to, you know, we, we get a lot of attempts into our computer systems as well. and. Um, Cecil McMaster, who, who was just up here, our Chief Information Officer, worked closely with M NYPD and the FBI on that. So there's coordination amongst agencies to keep the water supply safe and... Absolutely. Again, I'm not looking to broadcast it here today. I just want to make sure that it exists. <laughs> All right. Uh, and then the, so the other questions I have around the elimination of the Owl's Head uh, wastewater treatments to watering contract. Uh, I'm looking at... In, in, I know that the docks were in very poor condition. Um, what are our plans to ensure that other agency docks uh, do not ever reach that sort of level of disrepair? We can sort of get in front of these sort of challenges. So, so to remove sludge from most of our treatment plants, we have large vessels that come in and sludge is uh, loaded onto those vessels and then they, they, it goes off for further processing off site. Uh, the dock at Owl's Head, it, it, it had actually been inspected uh, not long before we, we noticed some squishiness in the roadway uh, leading to the dock. Uh, the bulkhead itself was, was in good shape, but 
Um, we, we were concerned about vehicles driving onto that roadway to help load the, the, the sludge vessel. So um, what we've been doing for, for the last uh, year and a half or so is uh, dewatering that sludge on site rather than having liquid sludge go onto the boat while those repairs continue. But um, Mr. Chair, we, we, we have and we continue to look at the, the docks at all of our wastewater treatment plant uh, to make sure that uh, they're, they're stable at this point. How often do we inspect them or make sure that they're in good working Pam condition? Again, uh, Pam or Jim, the dock inspections. This is Jim Muller, our deputy commissioner. For he, if you can just state his name for the record okay, before sure. he begins Jim, speaking. Jim Muller. Be um, so we'll do, uh, right, we've been working with EDC to program dock inspections. Uh, throughout the city. It's been a very valuable program. I know um, Pam and Pam staff has also been intricately involved. So, you know, we can provide more information on, on the status of that, but it's been a very good collaboration with EDC and ourselves to do that kind of inspection. And, and you said how, how often are they being inspected or what? Is I don't know if, the, if there's a recurring frequency to it. I think they haven't been inspected in quite some time, so a lot of these inspections are happening now, but we can provide more information on that. Can you provide that information to this committee um, you know, before the next hearing? I know, I know that some, I just want to say, I know that some ha had been inspected. I know Owls had because I had seen that report uh, previously. Uh, Rockaway, I know, had been inspected previously, so. And, and then, okay. Then the last question I have relates to, uh, again, the, uh, the FAD, which is, you know, we outlined and, and talked about it in great detail. Um, but the, the preliminary uh, mayor's MMR notes a decrease in number of acres of land solicited in the watershed uh, from 13,000 to about 7,800 in fiscal 18. Uh, why are we purchasing fewer acres of land upstate? So one very important uh, programmatic feature is purchasing land uh, around our watershed territory. So that we are the owners um, and can set aside that land for, for any future development that may take place that, that could potentially uh, affect our water supply. We've, we've had this land acquisition program now for, for decades and it's always been willing buyer, willing seller. So we'll solicit property owners, hey, would you like to sell your land? Here's what we think the, the value of your property is. And that that's We've done a great job, I think, over the last 20 years or so. But I think as the program matures, there's been less and less uh, owners of property who, who want to sell. They want to stay in their land. And uh, Dave Warren, uh, who's an assistant commissioner at our water supply, if you got anything to add, Dave, to that. Uh, good afternoon. Yes, my name is uh, David Warren. I'm assistant commissioner with the Bureau of Water Supply. Um, as the commissioner me mentioned in his testimony, we just passed a great milestone with the Land Act program. We've purchased 150,000 acres since 1997. Um, our new FAD continues to set solicitation uh, requirements for DEP um, at roughly the same rate they have been historically. Um, the FAD that just completed, we had a six-year, 300,000-acre solicitation goal. Um, the new FAD has a seven-year, 350,000-acre solicitation goal. So again, continuing to solicit at roughly the same pace that we have been uh, in recent years. Um, and I would just point out that 2017 was our um, highest year of acquisitions, that is signing contracts, since 2012. So we continue to acquire land through the ongoing solicitation process. But so it looks, you know, is that because we were soliciting doing more in 2017? It looks like our, our numbers are down as far as solicitation, so. Our, our solicitation, the, in the recent FADs, um, our solicitation goals have been set as multi-year goals rather than, than annual goals. That allows us some flexibility within the program to, to pace our solicitations. We also do solicitations in batches throughout the year, so that partial year number may not um, fully reflect where we will be by the end of the fiscal year um, because we, we, we sort of batch process. We'll send out a bunch of letters do solicitation on those properties, and then we'll do more later as the year goes on. How do we hold ourselves accountable on the purchasing? Uh, or at least, well, I guess we're only required by law to, to solicit, but not to purchase a certain amount of land? Right. So um, when the land acquisition program uh, began, the communities in the watershed expressed a lot of concern that if the goals were expressed as acquisition goals, um, that the city could potentially resort to condemnation 
So through the negotiation of the watershed agreement in the mid-90s, um, it was agreed that the, the target would be a solicitation um, with the city required to follow through if we solicit a property owner and the property owner ex expresses interest in selling to us, um, we are obligated to follow that through to, uh, to purchase. All right, so we're, we're, we're staying on top of this. Definitely want to see more on the exec and, and sort of talk further to make sure that we stay, stick to our goals and we are able to keep the fat because $10 billion, I know that the taxpayers don't, you know, the water sewer rate payers, $10 billion would be a hit to water rates that would be irrecoverable, correct? Yeah, so everyone's nodding yes, so. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't even need to verbalize it then. Um, so uh, with that, I, I will thank you, Commissioner, uh, and for everyone at DEP for all of your work. I look forward um, to getting some information from you and hearing more um, as the year progresses. Thank you, Commissioner, for your testimony. Thank you all. So we have uh, one member of the public to testify today. We have Phil Voss from Energy Vision. All right, uh, Mr. Mr. Voss, let's make sure your microphone's on and you can do your testimony. That. Okay, got it. All right. Uh, my name is Phil Voss, and I thank the chair and the committee for this opportunity to testify on behalf of Energy Vision, a New York-based 501c3 environmental group and a leading expert on alternative fuels for heavy-duty vehicles. Um, this testimony relates to another aspect of the committee's work, which is your work with the Mayor's Office of Sustainability in developing sustainability policy. We encourage the committee and the Mayor's Office of Sustainability to work to align city vehicle and fuel procurement policies with the city's climate and clean air goals by phasing out the use of diesel fuel among city fleets. Calling climate change an existential threat, the city's 2015 New York City Clean Fleet document set a goal to cut greenhouse gas emissions, or GHGs, from city vehicle fleets 80% by 2035. Biodiesel blends and electric vehicles have enabled some progress, but achieving the ambitious 80% target will require a major shift away from using diesel fuel. City diesel vehicles consume 60% of all fleet fuel and emit 63% of all GHGs. Fortunately, appropriate techno alternative technologies exist. Proven commercial and cost-effective compressed natural gas, or CNG, has been successfully deployed in New York buses and sanitation trucks, and its expanded use opens the door for two even cleaner options, biomethane fuel and near-zero emission engines. Any CNG vehicle can use biomethane, which is made by refining biogases from decomposing organic wastes. It has greenhouse gas emissions 70% or more lower than diesel and 40% or more lower than fossil natural gas. Biomethane made from food waste can actually be net carbon negative, which means that capturing the biogas to make it prevents more GHG emissions than it releases when combusted. Biomethane, also called renewable natural gas, is being used now in hundreds of UPS trucks and tractor trailers and in the refuse fleets of haulers like Republic Services and Waste Management. Santa Monica's entire bus fleet runs on it. LA is piloting it in 300 buses. And in England, Bristol, Nottingham, and Reading have all introduced biomethane buses. With, abu with abundant organic waste streams, New York could produce its own fuel. Biomethane now produced at Fresh Kills Landfill is being sent to California via pipeline. 
As noted in, DOP's, in DEP's testimony, food waste is now being added to sewage at the Newtown Creek Wastewater Treatment Plant to boost biogas production for biomethane. This could be repli replicated at other wastewater treatment plants. Gas from commercial food waste alone could displace 12 million gallons of diesel fuel. The addition of residential organics could displace all fleet diesel and drive the city's goal of zero waste to landfill. Heavy CNG vehicles that can use biomethane can also be fitted with EPA certified near zero engines. These engines cut health damaging nitrogen oxides and particulate matter 90% below EPA requirements. This would particularly benefit the often poorer neighborhoods that house many of the city's truck and bus depots. Combining the proven available technologies of biomethane and near zero engines would drive city environmental goals. Using the hundreds of millions of dollars now spent on diesel vehicles and fuel to buy cost-effective clean alternatives leverages the city's huge buying power to combat the existential threat of climate change. We encourage the committee and the Mayor's Office of Sustainability to ensure vehicle and fuel purchasing align with the city's environmental goals by tackling our outdated diesel dependence in favor of zero and near zero emission technologies that are available today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Voss. I appreciate your testimony. And, and as you know, this committee is uh, committed to reaching our goal of reducing uh, city emissions 80% by 2050. And, and uh, renewable energy and renewable opportunities are going to play a huge role in that. Um, so as we uh, you know, have over a million cars and transportation vehicles on the streets of New York City every day, opportunities to uh, reduce emissions from them will be looked at and in our city fleet. So we, uh, we should be setting the tone as a city when it comes to uh, emissions and, and, and vehicle emission reduction. So we will be in close contact with you and all stakeholders to make sure we get it right. That's excellent. New York City has been an environmental leader in the past. I hope it will continue to be so. And please view Energy Vision as a resource in addressing fleet emissions. Uh, we, we, we look forward to working with everyone as a partner as we get this done. We have to get, we get it done and get it done right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Anyone? All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Boss. Thank you. All right. With that, I... Do you want to say anything in closing remarks? Or are we good? All right, so with that, I just want to thank again our uh, financial uh, finance analyst, Jonathan Seltzer, our council, Samara Swanston, our policy analyst, Nadia Johnson, uh, and, and my staff as well, Nick Wazowski, my council. And uh, Eric Bernstein uh, from the finance division, and of course, it was great to chair this hearing with uh, my colleague and co-chair, uh, Vanessa Gibson. It was great to partner together. I look forward to doing it more in the exec budget. Um, so with that, I will gavel uh, this committee hearing of the Environmental Protection Committee closed.